All right, good to be with you this morning. Uh, my voice is a little funny. I don't know why I woke up and uh, and I'm, I'm an octave lower than normal, but uh, we'll, we'll, I'm, I can still talk, so that's good. And uh, I, I think that I found that very interesting, Terry telling that story about getting up this morning and discovering the snow, because it answered an age-old question of who let the dogs out. Now I know. It's, uh, Terry let the dogs out. Okay. Um, I am really uh, excited to share with you the material from this morning. Um, I, I have not, whereas I've heard some lessons on prayer, and probably not as many as I should, and I haven't heard many lessons on fasting, but I have heard lessons on fasting. I don't know if I can ever recall hearing a lesson or a sermon on meditation. Even though the word is all through the Bible. I think the reason for that is, is we shy away from it because there's so many misconceptions and evil things <laughs> that call itself meditation. It's part of yoga or um, a lot of martial arts, uh, Eastern mystic religions and uh, goofy New Age mumbo-jumbo stuff. So when we hear meditation, we automatically think of somebody sitting in the lotus pose, right, with their hands out, going, um, oh, um, oh, you know, and somebody like hitting a bell, in our, you know, with something really weird and not obviously uh, from the Christian tradition or anything like that. So when we think of meditation, we don't think of a uh, a biblical thing, even though it was a biblical thing. But as is often the case, the devil likes to take and steal something that comes from God, change its meaning and twist it, and then we'll shy away from it. But I, I don't like that. I don't like how the rainbow has been stolen when it means something wonderful, not what it's come to mean today. I, I hate how the, the rainbow has been stolen. And then the devil likes to change definitions. Uh, he, he takes the definition of faith and he warps it. He takes the, defini uh, uh, the definition of uh, uh, baptism and he warps it. He takes the definition of repentance and he warps it. He constantly is redefining words so that when we read the scripture, we're reading what it says, but we're not getting what it means because what God meant by that word and what that word means in the original language has nothing to do with what they think it means, you know? So, so many times I hear people uh, quoting verses to me and quoting and talking about, you know, judge not lest you be judged. And I, I feel like uh, the guy in Princess Bride, you know, you keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Uh, the, the, there's lots of times where people use a word and it's just the opposite. And this is one of those cases where what people think of with meditation is exactly the opposite of what the biblical words for what it meditation mean. So what is this Eastern meditation? Well, if you're, you know, wanting to relax and you're wanting to have inner peace and, and, and be enlightened, you would sit for hours and um, making the same noise over and over again, or you become mindless and empty yourself and think of nothing. Close your eyes. Go to your happy place. They got all this kind of stuff that they do to try to you're going to relax, breathe deep, in through the nose, out through the mouth, your chakra, blah, 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 blah. They got all this stuff that they do, some of which just has natural health benefits, so they try to act like it's something spiritual. Um, I don't know if you know it or not, but when you breathe in through your nose rather than your mouth, your body releases into your, more oxygen and stuff into your blood stream than if you breathe through your mouth. Like it's actually healthier. It's good to breathe through your nose at times. I mean, that's like a physical thing. But that's not meditation. That's just the way God designed our bodies. And uh, it can be very helpful to, you know, take deep breaths, you know, clear your, blow your nose and breathe. Oh, yeah. And sometimes we'll, we might do that if we were going to take, give, before a big something, oh, we're powering up because we can feel, we can get a sense. And you can do certain things physically, work out. I talked about a runner's high yesterday. You can do certain things to release endorphins in your body, just physical exercise, physical movements. And so 
like a lot of people, they confuse an endorphin release with a spiritual experience. The Eastern meditation person goes and sits and does some physical exercises for a while that causes an endorphin release, and they say, I reached enlightenment. It was spiritual. And, and we, we'll shake our head at that and go, oh my goodness, that's ridiculous. But it's no different than a person going to uh, a Christian concert, listening to music, and uh, listening to your favorite kind of music and enjoying the music and getting an endorphin release and go, oh, I felt the Holy Spirit moving. Look, don't confuse the Holy Spirit with an endorphin release. Z- my microphone quit, did it? It says it's on. You there, Brenda? Brenda's disappeared. My microphone's not. No, there's nothing in my pocket. That's just my phone. Am I back on now? Okay. It was an endorphin release. I had a release of something, but it wasn't endorphin. Uh, the, you know, don't confuse that with spirituality. And so, in fact, you know, sometimes when the Holy Spirit is moving and acting, uh, we might actually feel very bad. Um, sometimes the, the, the realest time of worship is when you're suffering and when you're going through something difficult and being obedient to God in faith, and that's when, you know, uh, go and look about when the Holy Spirit, it's not all, uh, you know, an endorphin release. And so people confuse physical things with spiritual. And they think, well, I'm nervous about something, I'm worried about something, I'm stressed, and they think, if I just empty my mind and don't think about it, that's the best policy. But I don't know about you, I haven't found long-lasting, deep peace, joy, and fulfillment from ignoring my problems and not facing my problems. They go off again. And now, you know what's going on? Keep talking? All right. We're not sure why my mic's going on and off, but um, that's weird. I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm talking. Is the microphone working? Okay, now it's working. Maybe if I just stand like this. Uh, I feel like it's when I was a kid I had to hold the, the, uh, the rabbit ears a certain way to get the channel I wanted. Um, yes, there we go. There, thanks. Uh, um, so... Uh, if, it, if it cuts out again, let me know. Um, where was I at? Okay, I was talking about how uh, we can't find real lasting peace, contentment, and joy from acting like our problems don't exist. You could get a short-term maybe endorphin release, but it's just a way of medicating a problem. It's like getting high or getting drunk or whatever. It, it might not have as many bad things to it, but some of it is opening yourself up. So some of this stuff is going to tell you, empty your mind, and then open your mind up and allow the energy to flow in, and all this kind of stuff, and they'll say this kind of stuff, and then now, okay, now we're borderline witchcraft, or outright witchcraft, and opening yourself up to possession by spirits and demons, and blah, I need a spirit guide, open your, open your, and so now you're crossed over from just, you're sitting there thinking about nothing, and a useless form of dealing with your problem to, okay, now I'm involved in some form of witchcraft and mysticism that's going to open me up to demonic things. And so we really need to be careful with what people call meditation. And even some of the things that become popular today uh, in the world for relaxation and meditation and stuff, uh, a lot of it, some of it's just harmless mumbo-jumbo. Some of it, though, is actually witchcraft pagan religion stuff that you know you're you've gone past just stupid to downright evil and so we have to be careful and i think that that sense of that that most christians have okay that's that's an area i'm not going to go has made us shy away from the word that's in the bible talking about meditation and what biblical meditation is so i don't want to give fasting to the pagans and their fasting and let them own the concept of fasting. Yesterday, I went through and I gave you the biblical teaching and I compared and contrasted biblical fasting to non-biblical fasting. Well, I want to do the same thing with meditation. I don't want to give the devil that word when it's in God's word. I want that concept. So, because not only uh, are we, um, you know, giving up a word that we should keep hold of, we're giving up a, a process and a concept that's a biblical one that maybe is something that we need. 
And some of biblical meditation I find people do instinctively in their Bible study. But I want to talk to you about, because it's more than Bible study, I want to talk with you about uh, what the Bible teaches about uh, meditation. Now let's go back to our, our first mention, let me turn this on, in the scripture of biblical meditation. Genesis twenty four sixty three. We went out. In the, uh, uh, he went out into the field in the evening to meditate. The he is Isaac, and he goes out in the field. And, so what did he do? He sat out in the field. He laid out his yoga mat. He got in the lotus pose. And no, that's not what he was doing. And so I thought to myself when I started to study this, I'm going to look up the word used in Hebrew because a lot of it's in the Old Testament. I'm going to look up the word for meditation. Well, I didn't know what I was getting into. Because there's a bunch of different words that are translated as meditate in the Old Testament. A ton of them in Psalms. And I'm like, I opened a whole can of worms. What have I done? Sometimes you like, like you think, oh, this will be just a short little steady jaunt here in the bigger picture, and then all of a sudden you've gone down a rabbit hole, and uh, you know, a couple days later you come up for air, right? That's how I felt with this, especially considering I'm not an expert in languages. Look, you know, people are like, are you learning Spanish? I'm like, I'm still trying to cover English. Yeah, the, um, yeah I'm trying to learn Spanish, but, uh, and um, I got really good grades in Bible college, except in Greek, and I, and I passed the class, but uh, I was no you know, scholar or anything, and I didn't take Hebrew, I, I, maybe I should have, because I probably would have got it, because everything's backwards, <laughs> that sounds my style, but um, um, in Hebrew, uh, I'm, I could try to pronounce some of these words we're going to look at, you know, but the thing is, we don't know exactly how ancient Hebrew was pronounced, because languages evolve over time, and even Greek, we don't know exactly, I remember one of the professors saying, we have our guess how they pronounced it based on modern Greek, but we don't know because the way things get pronounced, I mean, even if you, we don't, we wouldn't probably understand King, you know, if we went back to 1500, we'd probably have a hard time understanding the people in England because they spoke English, but it would be so different. And, you know, there's all, already all kinds of different ways, you know, potato, potato, aunt, aunt, you know, they have all different ways that they pronounce over there than we pronounce, and the, because pronunciation evolves. I mean, all you got to do is go, from Indiana to Louisiana, and you're going to hear a whole different pronunciation of the English language. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm finding that in Spanish, too, because uh, what certain words and certain pronunciations in, uh, in the Caribbean is different than Mexico, is different than South America, is different than Spain. And so languages evolve, and so we, I don't know, but uh, I, always, I always thought Hebrew was a funny language because it was so breathy. It sounded like someone choking. You know, to me, like a hawking up a, you know, um, a lot of that going on in uh, in Hebrew. I was like, it reminds me of Klingon, is what it reminds me of. But anyway, like, so the word here is suach, and they would that ach sound. They would, you know, uh, so I don't know. It sounds like someone coughing. Suk. Um, it means to muse pensively. No, I'm. I was so crazy, I had to look up, you know, like, muse. <laughs> That's not a word we do. I think I will muse upon that. Uh, not a word we use every day. I did know pensively, but I, I don't know, when's the last time I used pensively? Um, to muse pensively. Can we have a definition that we actually know? Or um, It means to think deep and, and thoughtfully, to reflect. So he went out into the field at night, evening, to enjoy creation. The mic's coming in. I'm in, I'm out, I'm in. Oh, don't fence me in. Um, do we have a different mic? This one's working for now, though, right? Okay. So, uh, so he was going out into God's creation that evening to spend some time. Now notice, to muse uh, pensively um, is to, to, that's translated to meditate. That means to think, to contemplate deeply. 
Now, we already have a contrast to transcendental Eastern meditation, where it's mindless. You empty your mind. But that's not what Isaac was doing. Isaac was going out to think deeply. Have you ever done this? Ever gone for a walk at night out in God's creation? I'm going to go watch the sunset and think about things. Ever sat on the beach and mused pensively? <laughs> Ever sat in your bass boat and mused pensively? <laughs> Ever gone out and sat in your garden, looked at your flowers, sat on your swing, watched your bird feeder, watched your squirrel feeder, you know, whatever, sat out and enjoyed a good, beautiful evening and mused pensively? That's a biblical form of meditation. It's not thoughtless. It's thoughtful. It's not mindless. It's a thinking of things. So whereas Eastern meditation says, forget about it. Put it out of your mind. Be clear your mind. This says, actually, to deeply think about the things of life. You know, I got a problem with our society today because it is designed for you to never do this. Most people are living in the burbs. And they get up in the morning and they slept that night in their little box. And they walk off to the little other box offside of that box. And they go to the restroom and then they get in a smaller box and take a shower. And they even have radios and stuff in there. And the whole time they're looking at their phone. Right? And then they go... And they go out to another box where there's a box parked that has wheels on it. And they get in that box, and they turn on the radio, and they listen to the radio. Or, even worse, they play on their phone all the way to work. Where they go to some big box building and go into a little square and get in their cubicle and sit and look at a screen all day. And in case they would stop and actually think about life and everything else, they play music to distract them. And they go to lunch. They look at their phones. They look at TVs. They come home at night. They get a little box out of their cold box with a little box of thing, put it in another box, heat it up, and take that box, open it up, get the food out, sit down in front of a, another box and watch it. Or sit with their little box and look at it. They go back and they go to bed. All day long, there's never a time when you stop and think. Where you meditate. I don't mean mindlessly go to your hmm. No, I'm talking about think about your walk with God. Think about your relationship with your spouse. Think about your kids and their needs. Think about these things. You don't meditate. Isaac made time to muse pensively, to deeply, contemplatively reflect. You need time. To process, to think, to have an inner conversation, and then to pray. You need to make time in your life to have real biblical meditation. Well, what does that entail? It means to ponder to oneself. I told you guys yesterday that you can't uh, think unless you talk. The thinking is actually a conversation. Even when you think to yourself... Even what you're thinking right now about what I'm saying is you're having a conversation. And it might be listening to my end of the conversation, but how you process it, you're talking to yourself and you have an inner monologue going on. And that is thinking. And learning, growing, understanding, and wisdom is all about conversation. And if you don't ever take time to process and to think and to muse pensively, you won't get it. And even if you know it, you won't know it. You can be seeing but not see, hearing but not hear, perceiving but not understanding. The Bible warns about that. Because people aren't meditating on what God said, on their life, on their events, on their actions, on what's going on. They got two and two, but they never put it together and make four, do they? And you're like, how do they not get it? Because they're not thinking 
And the only mental processing and thinking and conversation that's going on is what the little boxes are telling them to think. And everything is filtered through those boxes. And they aren't getting anything filtered from God or even from just pure logic that they could deduce if they would take time to stop and meditate. So it means to ponder to oneself. Here's another word. Um, we, we, see these wor- we see this word in Psalm 77, Psalm 119, Psalm uh, uh, 148, uh, 145. Um, this word is, is siach, and it means to converse with oneself aloud, to utter, to commune, to complain, to declare, to meditate, to muse, to pray, to speak, to talk. It means to talk to yourself out loud. Um, it has the idea of mumble. Do you know that's a biblical form of meditation? There's another word, uh, uh, siak. It's an unused, uh, from an unused word. It means complaint, amusing, complaining, complaint, concern, meditation, occupied talk. You ever hear somebody mumble, complain? O- older guys do this a lot, especially if they haven't you know, dealt in, in a good way with the relationship with their wife. You, know? you see the guy, he's walking five feet behind his wife, and she's like, go along, he's like, <laughs> that guy, he's mumbling to himself. He's meditating. Man, this woman tell me, I tell you. I just, just, just. Yeah. But we, you get these people who, that's, that's a form of meditation. Um, uh, and, these de- and then there's one, Icha, I guess that's how it would be pronounced. And it has the same idea of a complaint and a meditation. So it has the idea of negative things. And so when we meditate, sometimes we're recounting. We're repeating out loud. And sometimes it can be negative, sometimes it can be positive. It's not one way or the other. It could be, it could be either. It could be to amuse, to pray, to speak. It could be a psalm. Um, how many of you have ever quoted scripture to yourself when you're going through something bad? In your anger, do not sin. In your anger, do not sin. Sometimes, uh, you see me, uh, um, I'll, I'll be driving down the road and, and a nice motorcycle will pass. I'll be like, thou shall not covet. Thou shall not covet. <laughs> hmm. You know, <laughs> and uh, you know, sometimes we will talk to ourselves and that's a form of meditation. So whereas transcendental meditation is mindless and you don't think deep. Biblical meditation, you think deep. And whereas mindless meditation, you're just making noises, om, om. Here, you're muttering, saying, mumbling, talking to yourself, having a conversation with yourself, saying words, logic, truth. You might, you're singing a song to yourself. You're, you're quoting a verse to yourself. You're saying something to yourself. Maybe it's a positive affirmation. Um, you can do this. You can do this. You know? Uh, I remember when I was a kid, um, I felt like I ran faster when I sang the Battle of New Orleans. And when I would get in a race when I was a kid or I was running or whatever, you know, playing, I'd be singing to myself. <laughs> they ran through the briars and they ran through the brambles and they ran through the plains where the rabbits wouldn't go. I don't know why I would sing that song when I was a kid when I'd run. But I felt like I ran faster. Help me focus. We mumble, we say things, uh, we, and it's a way of meditating. And because we need to process and think things, and that requires a conversation. I lost it again. Um, it requires a conversation when we're doing that. And so sometimes there's nobody there to have a conversation with, or if there is, they're not worth having a conversation with. And so we need to talk to ourselves. You didn't expect me to come in today, to come into class and hear me say, talk to yourself. But you, you should. You need to recount. If you're discouraged, you need to talk to yourself about all the blessings God has given you. You need to, you need to be saying this. If, if you're feeling scared, you need to be talking about how great God is and praising God and, and, and talking to yourself about who He is and how mighty He is, or how faithful He is in keeping His promises. When Paul and Silas were in a terrible, 
Horrible situation. Chained to a wall, having been beat. They praised God, they prayed, and they sang praise to God. That was a form of biblical meditation. They were meditating on who God was in that terrible moment. And we need, to, that's why the Bible says to praise Him in all circumstances. Because we need to be saying it out loud. We need to be speaking out loud truths to ourselves. Because sometimes there's nobody else there to say it. And we need, that's meditation. It's a focusing on a thought, on a concept, on a thing that we need to be focusing on. It's rubbing some brain cells together and having that conversation. And sometimes it needs to be out loud. We need to hear ourselves say it. And, that, and that's what that, those words mean. To ponder to oneself by talking to oneself. And sometimes it's something you don't know and you're, and you're confusing. And have you ever done that? No, you're all by yourself. Now, where did I put that screwdriver? You're working on something. Where did, I, where did I put those keys? Why do you say that to yourself? Because you've learned over the years that when you say you can't access the memory, your brain filed it away somewhere and didn't leave a trace of where it filed it, you know? And so you talk to your subconscious mind. You're talking to your subconscious mind. Where did, I have found if I've lost something, I will say to myself, Kendall, where did you put those? Think for a second. And my brain will go, hey, dummy, you put them over. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I literally talk to myself. And it works. And you, you're laughing because you've done it. <laughs> well, some of you do it. So some of you men have wives. You're like, honey, where did I? <laughs> and, you know, and, she, you know, and then you, they'll be like, honey, honey. Uh, honey, where's the, uh, you know, the can opener? And then she gives the indirect answer. Where we always keep the can opener. And he's, then he's to go, honey, where do we always keep the can opener? <laughs> but anyway, we, some, we talk to ourselves and we ponder to ourselves. And that's why having a wife or having a husband or having a good friend or having somebody you're close to that you can talk to is so helpful because you can use them as a sounding board and talk to them about things. And sometimes they don't even give you the answer, but you go away comforted having, after having talked to them because you just airing your thoughts, organized them in your mind and allowed you to come up with a solution or to process it or emotionally deal with it or let go of it. Sometimes just telling somebody what you went through and crying about it and letting it loose helps you process it. What if they're not there? You need to be talking to God, number one, but you also need to talk to yourself sometimes. You know, ain't nothing but a thing, Kendall. It ain't nothing but a thing. It's not the big picture. Think about the big picture, Kendall. <laughs> you know, uh, they cut you off in traffic. They might be having a bad day. Who knows what's going on in their life? Don't get mad. You talk to yourself. You meditate. Put yourself in the right frame of mind. And that's part of biblical meditation. You ever, didn't know the Bible was telling you that, did you? But look at all the verses where those kind of concepts are used. Look at Psalm 77. I will meditate on all your works and consider all your mighty deeds. Ponder to self, talk to herself. He's saying, so literally, I will recount to myself out loud all your works. I will think about by saying them your mighty deeds. You recount to yourself. You don't just count your blessings. You actually say them. Now God Paid my bills before. God took care of me. God brought me through this. When I was sick and in the hospital, he was with me. And he did this. And, you know, he did. You know, um, we were talking about praying and fasting um, last night. Mark came up to me after. It's Mark Maskell. Um, and he was telling me about his son, Bryce, who I, I knew. They were members of the church at Jerome when I was there. And I remember Bryce as a, as a young teenager, a healthy, vibrant kid. But he told me a story from before I met them when Bryce was 12 years old, and he went to the Howard County Fair, and he, and he noticed his son was limping. And so he asked Kathy, his wife, take him to the doctor the next day. And they go to the doctor, and takes Bryce to the doctor, and they did an x-ray and looked at him and everything, and they said, he's got this bone degenerative disease. I can't remember what it's called. Perthes, Perthes disease. It makes your bone generate. And they said, he can't walk anymore. You've got to get him a wheelchair. He can't put weight on that. 
And he had had a friend when he was younger who had that disease, who was on crutches and, and could hardly walk, was in a lot of pain. And he was, he was just brokenhearted for his 12-year-old son isn't going to be able to walk anymore for at least five years, they told him, and, and that that bone was just going to degenerate and degenerate over time. And so Mark just fasted and prayed. He didn't eat. He just prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed to God, and they took him to the doctor for the next appointment, and when he got there, it was gone. His legs were even. Before, they had been uneven. Now his legs are even. And I knew Bryce, there wasn't any physical, I never knew anything was wrong with him. God just healed him when he fasted and prayed. See, that's the kind of thing that Brother Mark, now when he faces a problem, when he faces a hardship, he can go, God, I know, I remember what you did for Bryce, and I'm going to trust you to take care of me in this situation too. That's the kind of prayer he can pray. That's the kind of thing he can say. I can remember the time, God, you brought me through the loss of our child. You brought me through the hardship. You brought me through when my son was sick. You brought me through that time I lost my job. You brought me through this. You brought, uh, God, you're going to take care of me now. You meditate. You say out loud. You talk about it. You say to yourself, pump yourself up by contemplating. And so he's like, I'm going to meditate on all your works. I'm going to consider all your mighty deeds. Why? Because that reminds you of who God is and what he's done and puts you in the right frame of mind to have faith for the future. Biblical meditation, yeah, some of it's going to be uh, on God's word and what he said. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But some of it's just on who he is and what he's done. When I consider the heavens and the work of your hands, what's man that you're mindful of? it? What's he doing? What's that psalmist doing? He's meditating on the works of God, Right? The heavens declare the glory of God. What does that mean? When I look at your creation and I think about what you made, that really shows how awesome you are. And you need to think about those things and say those kind of things out loud. The way we find peace and contentment and joy, and the way we handle life's problems and struggles and trials is not by mindlessly meditating and emptying our mind and clearing our thoughts. No, it's by focusing our thoughts on the truth. And looking to Jesus and his power and his love and his goodness instead of what we fear might happen. Or the fading problems of this world. Or the temporary pains and struggles of this life that just will not last. Look, if you're a Christian here today, whatever your problem is, it's temporary. It's transitory. It's not going to last. You're not going to keep that problem. God's going to wipe the tears away and you're going to get to a day where that problem is gone, if you're a Christian. And those are the kind of things we need to think about to put ourselves in the right frame of mind. That's biblical meditation. To think about who God is and what he's done and what he said. To think about our lives and the context of truth. Meditation. And to think about where we are with him and if there's something we need to do to be right with him. That's what's supposed to be happening in communion, right? We're supposed to examine ourselves. Isn't that what it says in Corinthians? What is that? But meditation. He's not telling us mindlessly forget who you are. He's saying take a look at yourself and check where you are. Make sure you're right with God. If you're not, get right with him. That way, everything's good. That's biblical meditation. Do you know you're... You know, well, we had a communion meditation. What, what's that mean? It's to focus your mind on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. To set you in the right frame of mind. And we need to meditate on who God is and, 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 and what he's done. I can't go through all these verses uh, of where these were. But I, I put links there to you where these verses are. But you can check those out. But we don't got time to go through every verse. But I'm going to try to give you a sampling uh, of the words as we go, though. Okay, next word. I like this one. Doggall. It's not doggone, but it sounds like it. Doggall, okay? So it's uh, to murmur in pleasure or anger, by implication to ponder, imagine, meditate, mourn, mutter, roar, soar, speak, study, talk, utter. Um, you see it in Joshua 1 8. You see it in Psalm 1 2. You see it in Psalm 63 6. Psalm 77 12. Psalm 143 5. Isaiah 33 18. Wow, lots of places where it means to, um, to murmur. Murmur is kind of one of those onomatopoeias. It sounds like what it is. Murmur, 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 murmur. Doggo, 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 doggo. It's kind of the same thing. 
It's one of those words that sounds like what you're doing. It's your, your, your murmuring. And it might be in pleasure or might be pain. That's, what it, that's the word translated for it. Look what it says. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it. Murmur it. Quote it to yourself. Day and night. So you be careful to do everything written in the law. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Psalm 1-2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. It doesn't mean to just, hmm. No, it means to murmur it. Oh, though I walk through the valley in the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. The rod and the staff, they comfort me. Ever been in a situation where you're afraid and you start quoting scripture? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You know. Ever been in a moment of pleasure, of happiness and joy, and you start quoting scripture? You start murmuring to yourself, thinking by talking. This meditating doesn't just mean, oh. It means quoting it to yourself again and again and again. Nothing helps you memorize better than you quoting it to yourself out loud. Look at kids that have got to memorize verses for VBS week to get points or for a week at church camp. They sit there and quote it to themselves over and over. Look, you take a verse, you quote it to yourselves out loud seven times, it's going to be in there. It's going to start to stick. Quoting, and that's why I encourage you to read Scripture out loud. I do not encourage you to read your Bible to yourself. Now, sometimes that's the only way you can do it. You're in, in a place where you can't read out loud. It would be awkward. And, you know, you're in the work room at... at, at you know, you're in the lunchroom at work or whatever, and you want to read your Bible on lunch break, okay, fine, read it. But I'm telling you, the best way for you to read your Bible and get something out of it is to read it out loud. It makes you slow down. It makes you remember. How many of you ever read a chapter of the Bible and you're done? You're like, what did that say? You don't remember. You read it, but it didn't stick because you're reading in your mind. You do that out loud, you're not going to say that. You're not going to read a chapter of the Bible out loud and not know what it said. Your mind isn't going to wander off in another place. Your mind wonders when the mouth is not engaged. That's why it's saying to truly go deep, to make the Word of God stick, and to make the Word of God really attach, read it to yourself out loud. Another thing that I do is I listen to it read to me a lot. Um, a lot of times when I'm driving in the car, or even when I'm working out, I've got an app that, you know, just go to BibleGateway.com. You, you got a whole bunch of different translations, and you got multiple versions of it being read. But if you want it read to you by a, a guy with a cool British accent, you got that. If you want it read to you uh, with some music playing in the background, you got the dramatized version. If you want it read to you by somebody that sounds like an American, they got that. They got all these versions of it, you know. And uh, I, I like doing the New King James with a guy with a British accent myself. Uh, but somehow it seems more important to me. Uh, but... Um, I like, having, I like having it read to me because it sticks better when I hear it. I have a lot of verses in the Bible memorized that I never intended to memorize. Just because I've used them so often. You know? I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which I received and on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel you're saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you believed in vain. <laughs> you know? Uh, for what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. He was buried and he was raised from the third day, according to the Scriptures. You know, 1 Corinthians 1-4, through 4, I can quote from memory. I never sat down and said, I'm going to memorize the first four verses. of. No, I just quoted it so many times to people I was sharing the Gospel with, it's like embedded. And when you quote Scripture to yourself, you read it and read it to yourself out loud multiple times, it's going to stick. And now it's in your mind. Now you've got a weapon. Now you've got a tool. And when Satan comes along and says, look, here's some bread, eat, you can say, it's also written, man shall not live by bread alone. And when he tells you to, that if you're really the Messiah, you could jump off this temple and not get hurt, and the angels would catch you, he'd say, it's also written, test not the Lord thy God. How is Jesus able to do that? He hid the word of God in his heart. And that happens through biblical meditation. By you having a conversation with yourself. Say it out loud. And sometimes it's in pleasure. Sometimes we're quoting in pleasure. Sometimes it could be in anger. 
You ever murmur in anger? I'll tell you what that kid better, when he gets home, I'm going to tell that. You're thinking to yourself about what you're going to do. You're, you're murmuring, you're meditating. And what we are intense about will start coming out of our mouth. It'll, it, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So let it overflow out of you. Think about what you're meditating on. If you're meditating in anger all the time, and you're ruminating on that, and you're filling your heart with that, what's going to come out? Think about what you're meditating on. He says, you know, I'm going to meditate on the law of God. I'm going to meditate on God's on, day and night. In the morning and in the evening. What if, what if every day you got up and quoted scripture to yourself? In the morning, and then before you went to bed, you quoted scripture. Would you sleep better? Would you act better throughout the day? Would you live better? Would you be a better man? If you hid the word, a better woman, if you hid the word in your heart so that you don't sin against God, if you deeply thought about it and mused pensively upon the word of God, be a better person, notice uh, it, it can be, the emotion doesn't matter. It can be either. And it can be musical. One of the ways you meditate is musically. Look at this. Uh, this word here, um, a guth or whatever, it means, um, it's uh, in Psalm 49.3, it has a musing and meditation, but do you ever notice how muse and music sound alike? <laughs> um, the ha uh, is um, to murmur, a complaint, and a meditation and musing is the same ideas again, but it has the idea of musical. Uh, so does this last one, uh, higion, a resounding music, meditation musing, uh, resounding whispering. Um, it, it can ha have the idea of, of whispering. It's, it's in Psalm 19, 14. So these verses are there. Look at Psalm 49, 3. My mouth will speak words of wisdom. The utterance, and that word there, utterance, is also translated meditation. The meditation from my heart will give understanding. So the NIV translates it utterance, but other translations translate it meditation. It's that word for meditation, it's, but it's also an utterance. And the reason they put utterance there is because it's said out loud or it's actually sung. Some meditation is singing. Why does the Bible say for us to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to one another? And, and by the way, he, he says that in two different places in the New Testament. And it's not talking about in church. It's not the context of church. It's talking about everyday life. Um, you know... Dad never sang a song to me. And, I mean, he sang specials, I guess, to everybody, but Dad was always singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. I mean, it wasn't my style of music, but we'd be bouncing down the highway in the Cadillac. Like, it's a great, great morning, my first day in heaven, going to roll down the golden heaven. You know, he had, in fact, I heard, a, I heard a Southern Gospel song the other day that I'd never heard before, and I told Annie, my dad would have loved that. <laughs> he just would have loved that song. <laughs> and uh, Psalm 19, 14, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The meditation, the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. And so we want to speak and put into words. And so whereas some meditation is mindless m noises, Biblical meditation is a thoughtful, mindful expression of what's in our heart. And sometimes it might be happy, sometimes it might be sad, sometimes it might be angry. Um, on Thursday night, Shane was giving his lesson, and he was reading the scripture, um, in your anger do not sin, and don't let the sun go down on your anger. And what that means is, it's not a sin to be angry. But in your anger, it's easy to sin. In that heightened emotional state, right? And then it says, don't let the sun go down on it. In other words, don't hold on to your anger long. And that's part of what meditation is, is you might go out and let out some frustration. Sometimes, uh, 
you might have to step away from everybody, go off by yourself and just go, ah, what are these people doing? Let a little steam off so you're not doing it to them, right? I always explain it this way. If you take uh, a can of soda um, and you shake it up and you just open that bad boy up, it's going everywhere, right? That's why the Bible says don't give full vent to your anger. A fool gives full vent to his anger. The fool just pops the lid and blows up. But on the flip side, you don't want to hold your anger in and hold all that because you can bottle stuff up till finally what happens? Kaboom! You explode, right? Like somebody put the, you know, the little Mentos in the Diet Coke, right? Kaboom! <laughs> so what do you do? If, if somebody hands me a two liter of pop that's been dropped on the floor and we're having a party and I want to give everybody soda and, and I don't want to open it up and have it explode everywhere, what do I do? What do you do? I open it just a crack. And I don't let it build up till it explodes and I don't give full vent to my anger. I have a controlled release. And that's what biblical meditation allows for. You have this anger in you or this frustration in you or this emotion in you and you don't want that to control you. Then you need to have the opportunity to express to God or even to yourself this controlled release. You get it out of your system so that when you're with the individual you're upset at or the problem, you can deal with it in an appropriate emotional response and handle it. Sometimes you read the Psalms and they're angry or they're sad, or they're terrified, or they're scared, or they're happy. There's every kind of emotion you can imagine written in the Psalms. They were giving, what was that? It was a muse, it was a musical, it was a meditation of their heart. And we can present that to God in prayer, or we can just say it to ourselves, or we can express it in a song, or we can express it in a piece of art, or we can express it in work, or we can express it sometimes in our work. There's a lot of guys that treated their wife right because when they were frustrated, they walked away into the garage and, and worked out and worked it out in the garage or on lifting some weights or something. And then they were able to go back and have the relationship and act appropriately. Because they went out and meditated on it and they thought about it and they released their anger and then they were able to deal with it. Because we need to get ourselves in the right state mentally and emotionally. And it might be that we need to sing a song or murmur under our breath and talk to ourselves and, and release the anger, slowly let it out in a controlled way so we don't lose our temper. That's the value of biblical. It's not hiding. It's not like going, ah, this problem is not happening. This problem is not happening. Go to my happy place. Mm. Serenity now. Serenity now. No, it doesn't work that way. You have to face the facts and deeply think and address to yourself and have a conversation with yourself and go, okay, I'm angry, I'm mad, I've got all this emotion, they did this and I'm upset about it, but really in the big picture, it's not that big a deal and I need to focus on, on the end goal here, I need to focus on, and, I, and you talk it out to yourself, I've done it, haven't you? Didn't even know you were doing some biblical meditation. Sometimes I would even, I would even put on music that helped me release my frustration, you know, you know? And I'm not talking soft jump. You know, go for a drive. And I come back, okay, now I'm, over, now I'm better. Because I'm releasing to myself or to God or whatever this thing. I'm, I'm able to deeply process it emotionally. And that's what biblical meditation is about. It's about processing and getting yourself in the right mind. And it's a conversation. Um, Amar is this word. It's a primitive root uh, used with great latitude. This word has a lot of various meanings. Uh, to answer, to appoint, to avouch, to bid, to boast, to self, to call, to certify, to challenge, to commune, to consider, to declare, demand, desire, determine. See what I'm saying? But it's a broad, <laughs> there's a lot of latitude here. Declare, express, indeed, intend, name, plainly, promise, publish. It, it's translated all kinds of different ways. Um, to talk, the term is used to think. It's of speech, to utter, um, it's used in Psalm 4.4. 4. It has the idea of a conversation. And it can mean all those different things. But it's a form, uh, it's a, a word that they, they've translated as, as meditate. And 
the meditation is a conversation. All kinds of conversations that you might have with yourself. It's to think about stuff. It's not an ignoring of the problem. It's an addressing of the problem. Okay. And then this one here. Bakar. The primitive root means to plow. You go bakar the field, I guess. But it means to break up, to break something up, to break it down and look at it, to inspect, to admire, to care, to inquire. It means even to like dig something up. I'm going to go bakar for treasure. I'm going to go bakar up a field. I'm going to go um, break this down into pieces and look at it. So a word that meant literally physically to break up dirt came to mean uh, in the agrarian culture to break up a, a topic. So, I mean, wouldn't it make sense if you said, um, if you're in a farming society and you go out and plow a field and you break up the field and stuff that's in the field comes up, right? The Indian arrowheads come up, the rocks come up. When you plow a field, the stuff that's a little low and buried comes up, right? And so you might say in that society, well, this is a sticky problem and I'm not sure of their motives. I'm going to go plow through this and figure it out. See how they might use the word plow in that way? I'm going to go plow up this topic so that I can, I can deal with it. That's what the word means. And to meditate is to break something down, to open it up, to investigate it, to look at it. See, that's the absolute opposite of transcendental mindless meditation, isn't it? We are going to deeply think about it. We are going to contemplate. We're going to break it down. We're going to psychoanalyze it. We're going to, we're going to look at it from every... We're going to look at the facts and we're going to figure out what's going on here. Whereas a problem or a fear or a hurt or a need from the, the person who's worried about that, they just, oh, forget about it and just empty yourself and be, go to your happy place. That doesn't work. It doesn't last. Breathe deep. Yeah, that can have a short-term... Uh, release of endorphins, but it doesn't change the, 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 the situation or deal with the problem. Biblical meditation, you look at who God is and who you are and who the world is and what, what the big picture is. You're standing back and then you break it down and you look at the situation and, and where does this fit and how should I deal with it and what would God want me to do? And you think about it and you talk to yourself about it and you read scripture about it. You give input to it and you have a conversation with yourself about it. That's biblical meditation. Whether it's on God's word or God's deeds or God's creation or on yourself or on your problems or on your emotions, you are breaking it down and thinking about it. That's what God wants you to do when you've got problems. That's how God wants you to deal with them is to plow it up. And so we can look at that in Psalm 27.4, my favorite psalm. One thing I've desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. They translate it inquire there. Some places say to meditate on him or to meditate in his temple. What it means is to break it down, to contemplate and plow it up in, in his temple. What, he's like, there's one thing I want. I want to spend all my time with God in his presence, in his heavenly temple, and to contemplate and break down the aspects of God and his greatness and his glory. That was David's one desire. One thing I ask the Lord, one thing I require. I want to dwell in the house of the Lord forever, and I want to gaze at his beauty, and I want to plow through who he is forever. I want to be led and to know this eternal God led from glory to glory to glory to glory. Forever further understanding every facet of the infinite magnitude of my beautiful Savior. I want to meditate on God. There's no end to the facets of God's nature, His power, His wisdom, His goodness, and His person. And I plan on spending all eternity plowing up who God is. Being in a constant state of discovery and growing and learning. As C.S. Lewis said, further up, further in, further up, further in. More and more and more and more and more of who God is without end. Isn't it sad when a book ends and you stop learning or a story ends and you're like, oh, I was enjoying that. 
it's satisfying to come to some sort of conclusion, but it's also like, oh, I want to know more. Are they going to have a sequel? There's no end to God. There's no end to discovering Him. And guys, honestly, if we'll admit it, that's what's great about women, is uh, just when you think you get to know them, they change. <laughs> women, marrying, women foolishly marry men thinking, I'll change him, and he doesn't. And guys marry women thinking, she'll never change, and she does. The, um, but that's part of the fun, is you're constantly having to court her and date her because she's constantly changing. Uh, so embrace the goodness of that nature of women. It's one of the wonderful things about them. They're mysterious. You know, it's like, uh, uh, how do you understand a woman? Well, keep learning, buddy. It's a, it's a forever fun job that you have. It's, you're not done. You didn't go, well, we're married. I'm done. No, no you're not, buddy. You're just getting started. You know? and I, hope you, I hope you're one of those guys who enjoys the journey, not the destination, because uh, <laughs> that's how it rolls. Um, and that's how it is with God. There's no end to... He doesn't change, but there's no end to him. He, he's amazing. You're always learning something new about him. And that's the fun of biblical meditation. How many of you have studied the, the Bible for decades? Raise your hand if you studied the Bible. How many of you still discover new wonderful things all the time? Is there an end to that well? There's no bottom to that thing. You don't run out of water. That well doesn't go dry, does it? Well, if his written word doesn't, how much more the word that came in the flesh, the true word, God, there's no end to him. There's no, we're not, not going to get to heaven and go, uh, <laughs> oh, I've, I've got a God all wrapped up now. It is, we'll see him as he is, but it'll be forever discovery. If you like the excitement, excitement of, of discovering something new about God in the Bible and you enjoy learning new things about God and studying, good, because that's what you're going to be having forever. There's no end. And we are going to meditate, inquire, learn, study, break down, uh, investigate the beauty of God forever. That's a wonderful thought to me. A wonderful thought. But don't wait till heaven. Start now. Meditate on Him and who He is. So meditation is not mindless, but rather contemplative. It's not thoughtless, but rather a conversation with yourself. It's not only positive thinking, you know, I'm beautiful and I'm good and I, I'm smart enough and doggone it, people like me. No, that's not, that kind of positive affirmation only is not meditation, but sometimes it deals with complaints too. You deal with the negative side of who you are and what you need to change. Meditation is not only positive, it can be positive or negative. It, it's, um, it's not just sadness, but sometimes a recounting of pleasure and blessings. And it's not a distraction from problems, but rather a focus on the answer. Who is? That answer is Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So biblical meditation is in fact the exact opposite of what people call meditation today. See how the devil flipped it? He exchanged darkness for light, good for evil, up for down. And that, that's what he does. He's, he flips everything upside down and tries to confuse us with bad definitions. So don't shy away from the word meditation. Don't shy away from the concept of biblical meditation. Do shy away from a false definition of meditation and, and embrace this, this true one, what real biblical meditation is. Meditation is not emotionless. Sometimes it's artistically expressed in song. It's not unexpressed. It's spoken out loud. Not just in the heart, not just in the mind, the spirit. Say it. Speak it. Even if it's just a murmuring and talking to yourself. Sometimes it's to others too. You're helping them meditate by quoting God's scripture, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. It's not shallow. It's a plowing. It's a digging. It's a breaking open. It's an inquiring. It's an inspecting. It's detailed in its inspection. Meditation in the Bible is different than the mindless, thoughtless foolishness of Eastern meditation. That sometimes verges all the way over into witchcraft when you're opening yourself up to other things coming into you by emptying your mind. Look, let me tell you something about the Spirit of God. He never takes away your self-control. 
It says the spirit of the prophets are subject to the throne. When somebody says to you, oh, I couldn't help myself. The spirit just came over me and I did this. I was out of control. He took over. I, it was on. That, the, you may have had a spirit, but it wasn't the holy one. The Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Ironically, when you give God control, he gives you self-control. And the Holy Spirit never spoke through anybody against their will. He never possessed someone. When someone has a spirit that possesses them, it's an evil spirit. And don't open yourself up to spirit guides and something coming into you. And to, oh, that's that kind of meditation. That's, that's downright witchcraft. That's like you go to hell doing that kind of stuff. And you open yourself up to terrible things. And I know some of you are like, well, is that real? Yeah. If Bible tells you not to do it and warns against it, it's real. So the demons are real. The devil is real. And witchcraft is real. Revelation says that people who do it uh, are, are going to go to hell. Avoid that. Run from that. And run from mindlessness too. God, the word for him, for the word, is the word logos. God is logic. And meditation involves the use of thought and logic. We'll talk more about that. We're gonna, I'm already over five minutes. So let's take our 10-minute uh, break, and at 15 after, we'll start back up.